very last speaker for the evening is Brian Keating. Brian is the Calgary Zoo's Honorary Conservation Advisor and part-time adjunct assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Calgary. Please welcome Brian. Since I'm the last speaker and I'm an adult, I can do what I want. I'm taking the microphone out here. <laughs> okay, let's start the show. I want to take you to a, a thought concept that I've developed over the last couple of years, and it's from years of travel in Africa, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a kind of a new insight that I've developed into the concept of landscape preservation, something that I had no idea that was happening before, and it's the concept of the sacred forest. The sacred forest is a chunk of forest that has a, uh, a, a, a temple or a church within, or a religious artifact. In this case, it's the hippos. I've been involved in a project in northern Ghana for a number of years, the development of a hippo sanctuary. The reason why those hippos are still there, about four or 500 years ago, hunters for people were there to gather slaves. The people escaped to a small island from this dusty little corner in northern uh, Ghana. They escaped to a small island, and they walked across uh, rocks all the way across. Those rocks disappeared, and legend has it, those rocks were hippos. And so hippos were considered to be sacred. The Tindani, which is the earth priest, put the hippos aside as sacred animals, and they've survived to today. Now, we got involved in there by doing a number of projects. Uh, we built a number of water wells. I actually showed this slide to the kinsmen, and they were literally throwing money at me afterwards. But we developed, we did, dug seven water wells that uh, the 14 villages within the Wichau Hippo Sanctuary uh, used, and those wells uh, uh, provided a baseline of understanding. We also uh, provided some uh, uh, LED lighting that were powered by the sun, batteries that were sourced locally, so that, again, they didn't have to do anything on the international scene. And that was to encourage these kids to be able to read. Uh, uh, coal oil is expensive, and after the evening dinner was produced, the candle would have to be blown out, but with nature providing sun through the solar panels and providing light, the kids were able to study late into the night. And it's the children that are the hope for tomorrow. And it's the children that will eventually inherit the hippo sanctuary from these guys. These are the three chiefs that were eventually brought over to Calgary to open up the hippo exhibit at the Calgary Zoo, and they later came back. This was a, these are, these are people from one of the hottest places in the world, and here they are in January in Calgary, but wonderful, distinguished people, and they represented their country and the hippos very well. Well, my second encounter with a sacred hippo was just a couple of years ago in southern Tanzania, and this was through Dr. Jane Goodall, her son, grub has been very much involved in this place. It's a sacred hippo pool. It's believed that those hippos contain the souls of the ancestors of the village. And this has been going on for about 100 years. We got permission from the chairwoman, she's the chief of this particular area, to go in and film this project. It's going to air, hopefully, on National Geographic this fall. But this was our gateway into this very special environment where we met this fellow. You know, and this is a Yahaya, and Yahaya is called the Hippo Whisperer. Every second or third day, he goes down to that population of hippos in this beautiful pool, forested area, and he talks to those hippos and explains what the village has been doing, what the politics are doing. He gossips, I suppose, about who's doing what with whom, who knows, but he keeps the hippos informed, and there he is talking to the hippos. You can see the hippos in the background, and you know, whether or not we believe this kind of, uh, of, 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 uh, of religious uh, uh, um, belief in that these animals can understand, it doesn't matter. What I enjoy is the fact that they believe it. And, and it's preserving those hippos and the forest around. Now, the epicenter of this culminated in the last couple of years. I've been traveling to Ethiopia and exploring some of the remote areas. This is the Simeon Mountains and the Bali Mountains further to the south. We've done two expeditions over the last three years there. And these forest areas have some incredible uh, uh, biodiversity. Ethiopia is, according to the press, a place where there's a lot of dust. 
but if you learn about Ethiopia, it's actually called the water tower of Africa. Four or five major rivers come from these highlands of Ethiopia, including the Blue Nile. So this is a big deal. And these uh, environments support a variety of, of wildlife that is endemic only to Ethiopia. In this place, this is Ayuba. He's our guide last year when we went on a 160 kilometer trek across the Bali Mountains, and he was showing us the, the Ethiopian wolf which is a, an animal that has learned how to prey on the rodents that live up in this environment. And this is a, a, an Abyssinian owl, again, one of the endemics of Ethiopia. I was totally unaware of, of how rich the biological diversity of Ethiopia was, but what makes it even more interesting that since 400 AD, the, the Coptic Christians have basically created a Christian landscape. They've built 35,000 churches. These are churches that are dug right out of solid rock, straight into volcanic rock. These churches are all surrounded by forests. Some of them are measured in the hectares or square kilometers in size. In other words, the 35,000 churches in Ethiopia have created a place of biological wealth that now Oxford University is beginning to try to work out. It, this is, and these are what the churches look like. There's not one bit of cement there at all. That's one rock carved out of the ground. Some guy, seven or 800 years ago, decided that they needed to carve a bunch of churches like this. So you can find this in a place called Lalibala. They're absolutely amazing and the churches are used as churches today. But the fact is it's created these wild areas around. Now let's transfer this to home. This is the landscape just south of Calgary from along the foothills. One half of 1% of the best grassland landscapes are still in existence up against the foothills of our Rockies. They've been preserved because of the ranchers that have ranched this land for the last hundred years. Charlie Russell lives uh, down there, that's right, in the hawk's nest. His father, Andy Russell, was one of the conservationists, a ranching conservationist. And they looked down upon the landscape in the 1990s and realized it was going to become a subdivision of Calgary. So they got together with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, which used to run on about a $15 million a year budget. Now it's $100 million a year. And they have pretty well put every piece of the jigsaw puzzle together from here to Waterton to create what I believe will someday be regarded as the sacred forests of our foothills. And I think that it's time that we stop uh, selling nature and stop buying nature, but regard it for its intrinsic value for what it's worth to keep our ecosystem alive. Thank you very much.